Hey everybody, we're back with another episode of Flipped History. Our topic today is American foreign and domestic policy during World War II. So our learning outcomes. You should be able to describe the major domestic policies that kept the U.S. out of war, uh, starting with neutrality. Uh, describe FDR's four freedoms. Understand, and lastly, understand the growing role of women and minorities in the war effort. So neutrality and cash and carry. The Neutrality Acts passed in 1935. We talked about it briefly in the last screencast. Basically, what it does is outlaw the selling of arms to nations that are at war. Uh, cash and carry uh, passed in 1939. This is at a time where we've already seen Hitler come to power and start to expand. So at this point, we're trying to move away from the neutrality acts itself. So the cash and carry is a little bit of a, a loosening of the ties on the president. What this, state, what this states is foreign countries can come to the United States and pay cash up front. Uh, there's no credit, nothing like that. They must transport the weapons on their own ships, so we don't have a situation like the Lusitania that we had uh, with sinking of, of uh, sinking of the Lusitania and losing of American life. France and Britain could defend Hitler this way. Uh, they're coming into a point now where it's going to be pretty quick, and France is going to be basically overrun. And also, this will keep the United States out of the war. They're paying cash up front, so there's nothing on credit, and there's no transportation on American ships, so therefore we can stay technically neutral in terms of actual fighting. Well, that really doesn't work very long. Um, we end up becoming known as the great arsenal of democracy, and what that means is we can't let the British fail, because once France falls, what else is left? There's really Britain, that's it. We have Spain with Francisco Franco, who is... A fascist, I mean, not necessarily in the war, but at this point, Britain is all we have left in terms of an ally. Um, and where, where are the Nazis going to go uh, after they expand uh, past Britain? And if we don't help Britain, who knows, they could be overrun. So we must help Britain defeat the Axis powers. If they're left unchallenged, who knows, we could have Nazism in Missouri, for example. So the Lend-Lease Act, because what's going to end up happening through the cash and carry Weapons are expensive. Defending a war is expensive, and they run out of money really quickly. Britain and France are broke uh, from 1939 to 1941. Congress, again, is going to loosen its, its ties on the president and what he can do, and with this Unlease Act, will can lend or lease arms to a country whose defense was vital to the United States. Strangely enough, the country that took the most uh, part of the mo – took the most part of the Lend-Lease Act was the Soviet Union. And FDR sums this up as saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So at this point, we now have the non-aggression pact that Stalin and Hitler had signed is basically out the window, null and void. So if Stalin is Hitler's enemy, then he must be our friend or FDR's friend. So he's the one that's going to take advantage the most of the Lend-Lease Act, even though it's supposed to be entitled for the British and the French. The Atlantic Charter. Roosevelt is going to be called to by Churchill, uh, and basically what he wants to do is have a conference, because what Churchill's aims are, now that he's the Prime Minister, is to get the United States involved in the war. So they're going to meet on the USS Augusta, and what it's going to do, and obviously it wasn't known as the Atlantic Charter at the time of uh, its signing, uh, but what the whole point of it is is to force collective security, disarmament, self-determination of, of countries, economic cooperation between world powers, freedom of the seas. All of this is summing up basically a joint declaration of war aims. Churchill wants FDR to get involved. The problem is the president cannot declare war. He can only ask Congress to declare war. And at this point, Congress is supposed to be representing the other people, and the people don't want war. The, the images and the harshness of World War I is still fairly fresh in these people's minds. They don't want another war like this. Okay, And ultimately what this is going to do is become the basis for the United Nations. Churchill is not going to get a declaration of war by FDR here or a, a joining of the war by FDR. But this Atlanta Charter is going to be signed by 26 countries. And basically what, what uh, Churchill is going to say that this is signed by four-fifths of the free world here. Uh, at this point, I mean, think about it, considering the, Nazi, uh, the Nazis have overrun most of Europe and then we have the fascist Japanese overrunning almost the entire Pacific region. Um, there's not a whole lot that's left aside from the, the uh, 
the English and the Americans. Domestic policies now. Defense spending is through the roof, and really this is what gets us out of the Depression. Roosevelt breaks the two-term tradition set by George Washington and gets elected to a third term. Now, you may be thinking, wait a minute, how is this possible? Well, we don't have that, that constitutional amendment limiting presidents to two terms until after Roosevelt. He breaks the tradition, and the reason why he really gets elected for a third term is there's really no, not a whole lot of difference between him and his opponent. So people will go with the known enemy or known, known evil versus the unknown evil. We're going to have the first peacetime military draft instituted, uh, the Selective Service, which we had talked about before, which we have 16 million people that are ultimately going to be signing up for Selective Service, and 10 million of those are going to be drafted after uh, the incident at Pearl Harbor, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So FDR gives a speech. It's known as the Four Freedom Speech. What he is going to outline is the four essential human freedoms. One of them is freedom of exp uh, speech and expression. Number two, freedom to worship God in his or her own way. Number three, freedom from want, which may be the most difficult one to understand. Uh, economic understanding and healthy peacetime life. Basically what this is is freedom from someone else coming in and overtaking you. Uh, that you should be happy with the stuff that you have. And lastly, number four, freedom from fear, which is basically what he's talking about here is a reduction in worldwide arms. Uh, in peacetime, what do you need all these weapons for? Uh, if everyone is living in harmony, you don't need as many guns as you had previously. The government is going to step in. There is going to be, with the wartime production industries taking, uh, taking hold, there's going to be a high level of inflation. The OPA is supposed to fight that. There's going to they're going to institute price freezes. Okay. There's also going to be a rise in income tax. The War Productions Board is basically the one in charge of telling which companies are going to be switching to producing war items. For example, if it's a sock company or a boot company, maybe now they're going to be creating military socks or military boots, or if it's uh, anything like that, a uh, metal factory, or, or uh, they'll basically be transitioning into a wartime industry. We also are going to see rationing again. We saw this in World War I. Uh, if you remember back to Woodrow Wilson saying one day would be meatless, one day sweetless, okay, one day wheatless, there, we're going to see this again in World War II with the rationing of the fixed allotment of goods, and we're also again going to see war bonds come to the forefront. Things like this, you buy them, we'll fly them, defense bond stamps. Here's another one, you can't afford to miss either. Buy bonds every payday. So they're encouraging the American people to buy bonds every payday. Here's another one. This one is more of a tugging on the heartstrings, more of a morbid one. What did you do today for freedom? Today at the front, he died. Today, what did you do? Next time you see a list of dead and wounded, ask yourself, what have I done today for freedom? What can I do tomorrow that will save the lives of men like this and help them win the war? So this is kind of making you feel bad if you're out there uh, being frivolous with your money while you're sending people overseas and they're dying. Here's another one. United We Stand. This is playing on the segregated times at this point. You have the African American on one side and the uh, white guy on the other side, and they're working together in the war effort. Here's another one for the women out there. Victory waits on your fingers. Uh, women were vital in the role in wartime and taking those positions as they did in World War I and proving themselves worthy once again to do the job just as well, if not better, than their male counterparts. Here's another one. Waste helps the enemy conserve material. So what does it look like? It looks like Hitler here. We have a paper clip and some other stuff, a couple of nails, pencil, piece of paper. Here's also another one of my favorite ones. When you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. Join a car-sharing club today. Basically what it is is to conserve the fuel uh, to create these carpools. So with service, factories were converted to wartime production like we just talked about. Five million ended up volunteering for service at this point. The Women's Auxiliary Army Corps is created. Uh, eventually the auxiliary part of this is going to be dropped. They're more, more so in non-combat positions, the nurses, drivers, any sort of operators or transmitters. There are six million of these women, and they're doing the same job. Again, we're seeing not equal pay for equal work. They're getting about 60% of a man's wages. And minority groups are seeing combat, but they're seeing segregated combat. 
Uh, you're going to have about 33,000 Japanese Americans that are going to volunteer even despite being relocated with 9066. You're going to have over 1 million African Americans, um, um, Native Americans, and also Chinese Americans that will help serve uh, in the war effort. So let's recap. You should be able to describe the major domestic policies that kept the United States out of war. We have the Neutrality Acts, the Lend-Lease, Cash and Carry, all that good stuff. FDR's Four Freedoms. Kind of sounds like the First Amendment, if you ask me. And lastly, understand the growing role of women and minorities in the war effort. If we didn't have these people, we would not have been able to do as much as we did during the war. Women being the operators, being the nurses, and with the minorities helping any way that they can in the war effort on the front lines and in the factories, we would not have been able to uh, mobilize as quickly as we did. So if you have any questions, let me know. Send me an email. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. I'm out.